Hello everybody, my name is Julian or Flow Graphics and this is Game Design for Noobs. I'm going to be going through what it takes to make a game and all the facets that actually create games and, and how it all works. Whether you're a gamer yourself or you're just interested in the technical aspect or the art aspect, it's pretty interesting what actually makes games. And I've been able to sort of dumb it down to four categories. This is scenes and cameras, assets, code, and then the system. So the scene or the camera, uh, that's basically how you play the game and that's the playground that uh, the game is. So what sits inside the playground is, is all the assets, all the things. That's, you know, the people, the playground equipment, the trees. Like you can see a barrel, a gun. Uh, I'm trying to draw Mario from the top of my head. I think I'm doing okay. Like Mario, this can be 2D or 3D um, and the scenes themselves can be 2D or 3D. And then what actually makes these scenes work and what makes it so we can move characters around and shoot guns is code. It's a, a bunch of sort of numbers and letters and commands and it's, it's different languages that actually create the brain of the game. And then onto system, that's how we actually play the game, whether it's on a console, PlayStation, uh, whether it's on an airplane or a TV or a mobile phone or whatever it may be, there's tons of different systems and ways to actually play games. And the scenes, the cameras, the assets, the code, all of the stuff that creates a game changes depending on what system you play it and depending on what game it is. So let, let's get straight into it. It's really interesting. I'm going to take you along with me. I'm going to draw a bunch of stuff and, and just try and show it as visually as possible. So starting off of scenes, like I mentioned before, this is the playground. This is the actual world in which everything happens. So the scene can be 3D, it can be 2D, uh, so like Call of Duty for example, or a game like Mario. They're both games and they both share tons of similarities, but they're both sort of made in two different ways. And if we want to sort of see how a camera works in a 2D scene, I'll just quickly draw up a little sort of 2D plane here. Let's pretend this is our level of a sort of Mario. Um, and what we're going to do is place a character in the scene, place a little camera, and you can see that's the whole level, that's everything that exists inside the scene, and then we just have our camera, which is a little rectangle that can be sort of moved around the scene, and that's what we view, that's what we're taking in. That's the whole visual component of that scene, that's all that exists. And if we draw a 3D scene and draw a bit of a terrain and some islands and stuff like that, just like you see when you walk outside and you can see with your eyes, you have 3D vision, we're in a 3D world, and there's things like perspective uh, and a, a lot of other things that take sort of make 3D rendering a lot more interesting, a lot more complicated and intensive for a computer, though it's a really similar concept. I have this same camera except on a person and it has perspective and I can walk around and do flips and, and take in the environment from a 3D perspective view. And the next is effects. So just like we view the world through the camera, uh, this is basically what pair of sunglasses we're wearing. So this is adding a sort of an effect after you're actually viewing everything. And this is everywhere in games. Almost every single game that you play will have some sort of image effect or camera effect to have a certain look or do, do a certain task. And there's tons of different effects we can sort of have throughout games. So if I draw a quick little scene here, let's say we just want to change the color and we do want to do some color grading to the scene to make it look different. Or maybe we've just had a gunshot wound and we want this sort of trippy RGB effect to make it look like we're on low health. Or maybe you want to warp and distort the player's view and make it look like they're tripping out on drugs or something, who knows? You can do whatever you want. There's tons and tons of different effects and ways that you can manipulate the camera, manipulate what you're looking at, even if it's something as simple as just like a Viganet blur and sort of make it look like it's, you know, a sniper scope or something that you're looking through. So when you're clicking through a game's graphic settings and you see words like ambient occlusion and ray tracing and depth of field and motion blur and all those sorts of things, they're all effects. They're all things that basically change the way that you view the game and they're just different pairs of sunglasses that add cool effects to the camera. And now on to the assets. So this is the stuff inside the playground. And this can be anything. This can be the people, the swing sets, the play equipment, the trees, the bits of rocks and grass on the ground, uh, literally anything. And the reason why it can be anything is because most game objects, or sorry, game engines, uh, use a thing called object-oriented programming. And although that might sound a little bit sort of techy and confusing, it's super, super simple. And the reason it's super simple is because everything just starts off as the exact same thing. So if we have a tree and we want to create a tree inside of our game, uh, most game engines just start that off as a transform, a position. It's just simply a point within our scene. And then we can add components to that to create a tree. We can add a mesh, which is an actual 3D object and then suddenly we have an actual 3D tree at that position in space and then we want to make the tree look cool and have color so we add a material to that and we can add in all these components and actually customize 
exactly what that asset is depending on what we add to it. They all start off as the same thing and they all function in the exact same way, but we're essentially just like making them in like a prefabricated, customizable way, um, sort of like building blocks. So a tree, like you can see here, this is static. It doesn't move. It's simply just got a point in space, a mesh and a material. But then if we were to copy this over, we could make a different type of object, like a player. And this is going to be dynamic. It's going to have physics. It's going to have code making the player move around. We'll probably have to attach a camera to it. And this is a lot more intensive and this is a lot more different than the tree, but they both start off as the same object. And the things that make the different components that make this thing work, um, they affect the game in very different ways. The transform, super, super easy for the game to handle. It could handle a million transforms. That's no problem. Rendering the meshes and the materials, that starts to become a bit more intensive and then physics and code become quite intensive for the game. And these things can change. If you have a really high, crazy material, that's gonna make the game race run slower. If you have a mesh that's really, really complicated, that's gonna run the game slower. And the 3D mesh is made up of tons of these little things called polygons. And polygons are basically just a bunch of triangles that are all joined together to create the actual 3D mesh. And simply put, the more triangles, the more polygons, the more intensive it's gonna to be to render. Whereas a 2D sprite, that's just simply just a photo. It's just a tree.png or tree.jpg in your files, and then it pulls that file and displays it. But a 3D mesh has the 3D file, but then if you ever made a paper cube or a paper pyramid or something like that in school, uh, it basically gets a flat texture and then wraps that around the 3D object as well. So it has a bunch of different files rather than just one or two files that the sprite has. But then it's also going through way more intensive rendering process because instead of just rendering a flat texture and no lighting or very basic lighting, it has shadows, it has all sorts of bounce lighting. Every single one of those little triangle polygons is basically a miniature version of that 2D sprite that's getting rendered. Although it can vary a lot, typically, 2D objects will be quicker to load for the game engine and 3D objects will take a bit longer. So onto code now, this is the brain of the game. And if we're still talking about the playground, this is everyone's brains. This is the laws of physics in that playground. It's when the lights turn on and off. Um, it's when, how the swings swing, it's what people do and it's everything. It's basically all of the systems that make that playground work and make the things inside that playground move around and do stuff. So if we have our scene here, we can sort of divide our scene into two components. We have the, the actual live scene, all the visual stuff that we're looking at, and then all the code that's related to that scene. And then there's a third part. This is all the files and all the sort of the databases and the stuff inside the game engine that's working behind the scenes. So when you load into a map in Call of Duty or Counter-Strike or something, you have the game scene that you're in and you have all the other players with you and all that stuff related to the scene. But then you also have files. So you have all of the textures of the ground and all that sort of stuff. And all that's getting pulled from the files on your computer and getting displayed to you on the scene. So for example, a game like Mario, we have our player, which is that player that we built before. And then we maybe we'll have a bit of code that's the level manager. And that basically controls when the player hits that flag, we'll load a different scene and we'll change levels. Or when we very first start the scene, we go into the files of the game and we think, okay, what weapon does the player currently have equipped? And we have a big long list of all the weapons in our files in the game. And then we go, oh, the player's got the bow. So then we go into the files, get the bow, and then we give it to the player in the live scene. So the sort of the files on your computer constantly interacting with what's live in the scene because that's all the contents. That's all the stuff that's actually getting displayed in front of you. And that takes us to lucky last, which is system. So if we're still talking about the playground analogy, this is basically where the playground is, what country it's in, what city it's in, because this totally changes everything about the playground or everything about the game, depending on what it's played on. Is it a PC, a console, a mobile? Or is it on a plain screen? Is it on a TV? Is it on a Tamagotchi? Almost any electronic device can play a game. So let's just narrow it down for two for now. We'll start with a mobile and then a console. So these are very different devices. One, let's say has one gig RAM and like a, 64 gig uh, hard drive and then console would have four gigs RAM and a way bigger hard drive at a terabyte. So you have different limitations of what you can actually create in these systems, but then they also have totally different inputs. A mobile is played with a touch screen typically, but then you also have things like motion sensors, accelerometers, the gyroscope, all sorts of stuff, even the photo and the video mode and the camera or the microphone. There's tons and tons of different inputs that you can actually give to a phone to play a game. 
uh, console, you have your controller, but then you also have things like the Wii or a Kinect, uh, motion sensors and videos, and then you also have a microphone uh, if you have a microphone headset. So if we have a tree in a mobile game and then a tree in a console game, these trees can be completely different depending on how the input works, how that affects physics and the code, and also how much stress that actual uh, physical thing can hold. So if the console has a lot more RAM and a bigger hard drive, it can load way bigger materials and textures and it can handle a lot more physics and things happening. So if we're making the same tree for a mobile game, maybe we'll have to scrap the physics and scrap the code and just make it a static object. And then we'll have to compress the mesh and compress the materials and make it a bit smaller file size where a console, we can change the physics and the code depending on how we're playing it. So here's a problem for all of you at home to solve in the comments. So what I'm going to do is give you three little sort of clues or questions and you will have to give me the answer in the comments down below. So I'm going to draw a little barrel here and this barrel is made up of a bunch of different shapes. So that's how meshes work. And what I want you to tell me is what's the name of the shapes that actually make up a mesh. They have a very specific name to do with game design. I did say it earlier. So just tell me what that is. That's number one. And next I'm going to draw a ball, but this isn't any ball. Uh, this is a ball that I want to control. So like I went through before, we add different components to make objects different. So it's got the physics and it's got a mesh and all that stuff, but I want to add a brain. I want to make it so I can press stuff on my keyboard and something happens. What, what would I have to add? What would I need to add to that ball to make it work, to make it do stuff? So next I'm going to draw two balls, except one of the balls is actually a circle. So we have a 2D sprite on the left and then a 3D sphere or a mesh on the right. And what I want you to sort of answer for me is which ball inside a game engine is actually going to load the slowest, a 2D or a 3D. So make sure to write your answer in the comment section of the video and I'll leave a hidden answer section myself in the comments if you want to double check and see if you're right or not. So I hope you enjoyed everybody. I absolutely love making these videos and teaching you these cool things. Um, if you don't know, I'm designing a game myself. I make regular game devlog videos. So if you're interested in that sort of stuff, feel free to subscribe if you're new here. Uh, as always, everybody, my name's Julian or Flow Graphics. I hope you all have an amazing day. I hope you learned something new today and thanks for watching. I'll see you later.